Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, James Jeffrey. I'm the chair of the Middle East program, at least uh, I have been for the last month. And uh, we're very, very uh, happy today to pre be presenting uh, the latest uh, session of the Arab Barometer polling. Uh, this is very, very important with a new administration uh, just getting uh, uh, into power here in Washington uh, and the Middle East, as we saw from uh, Secretary Blinken's press conference yesterday, uh, is essentially at the top of the agenda. Uh, you may try to pivot out of the Middle East, but the Middle East pivots back to you, as Blinken discovered yesterday. And so uh, we're here today uh, to try to look into some of the detailed facts, the detailed views that are so important for any administration or for anybody who follows the Middle East uh, to shape opinions and to uh, uh, try to uh, figure out what works and what doesn't in this uh, fascinating but very complex region. I would like to turn it now over to uh, Marissa Huma, who will uh, do the formal introductions. Marissa, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jim, for your introduction. Uh, welcome to all of you watching and listening today. Um, I'm delighted to be moderating this discussion today, um, the, which we are hosting as MEP with the Arab Barometer. Uh, we will be talking to Dr. Michael Robbins, who's the president of the Arab uh, Barometer. We had the pleasure of hosting Michael, uh, I think two years ago at the Wilson Center, back in the day when we did in-person meetings. And um, uh, the topic then was Arab views on economic conditions, on women's issues, and youth. Uh, today, the discussion, as Jim mentioned, will, um, will pivot to how the Arab public, uh, particularly in the six countries surveyed, view the United States uh, in comparison to other great powers, um, including China and Russia, but also regional powers, including Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. Um, and as Jim mentioned, this is a very timely discussion as the Biden administration uh, moves in to start to chart out its path in the region. Uh, to help us unpack and better understand these findings, the geopolitical and the sociopolitical context behind them, we've invited two of our Wilson fellows, Asher Orkabi, um, who uh, joined us in the fall of, of 2020 and whose expertise is on Yemen and has um, recently written a book on Yemen, and Lucille Greer, whose expertise is, is on China and Middle East relations, and her most recent publication focused on China and Iran. So Michael, I'm gonna to turn to you first um, to tell us a little bit more about the Arab Barometer. Um, why is it important uh, as a project? Uh, and then uh, basically walk us through the most recent findings about great power competition or as well as regional power competition in the region and what the people think. Perfect, thank you so much, uh, Marissa. I, it's uh, great to be back at the Wilson Center. Um, wonderful to, uh, to have this event and especially at a very timely point um, with the new administration. So what I wanna to present today is some of the recent findings we have coming from the fall of, of last year is the sixth wave of Arab barometer um, Arab Barometer has been doing, conducting surveys across the region, um, the Middle East and North Africa for the past um, 15 years now. We did our first surveys in 2006 and have done five different waves uh, before this, comparing the, the results um, of how attitudes have changed over time. This has been a bit of a challenging um, year for us, as it has for everyone, um, given the um, given COVID. And so what we've done is we've shifted to phone surveys. We've always before done face-to-face -face surveys in people's place of residence. And given some limitations and also um, some restrictions on funding, we've only been able to, at this point, include six different countries, which are Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, um, Jordan, and Lebanon. So I will present findings from that. We are looking forward to uh, having a, a wave uh, in the future of the coming this fall that includes more of the countries, hopefully at least 15 across the region. But at this point in time, I wanted to give you a, a brief uh, update of our, our results. And I should also say that you know we are the largest um, project that does this type of work. All our data are public, so if you have interest, you can certainly go to our website, um, download our data, or use our data analysis tool uh, if you don't have the, the you know, st statistical software to do, conduct the analysis. So uh, first, let me give some key findings from wave six. Um, so as the Biden administration approaches, this, the surveys were done in, in, uh, in basically September through, uh, through November of last year. We find is that he inherits a, a, a fairly low view of the United States across the region. 
that in all countries that we surveyed, fewer than half the citizens view the U.S. favorably. And particularly thinking about the great power competition, um, you know, China is viewed significantly more positively. But still, as we dig into this more deeply, we find that there's evidence that Europe's, Europe, uh, Arab citizens may not prefer China so much, or China Inc., but really Europe Inc. So there is uh, certainly a, a, a number of, of nuances to this overall finding. Um, what we find is comparing Trump and Biden right before the election, that we find that, that support for Biden was significantly higher, typically much higher um, in all countries with the exception of Lebanon. Um, we also find that um, at the same time, despite some greater preference for Biden, relatively few expect uh, U.S. foreign policy will change as a result of the election. So there's not necessarily much hope that, that you know, that, the, that uh, among citizens that they'll see a, a major change, again, with the exception of Lebanon. Um, at the same time, though, uh, in thinking about how the U.S. might want to improve its views uh, or views in the region, many do see uh, the U.S. assistance having positive benefits for their country. So this is something that, you know, the, the Biden administration may want to think about and, and assess uh, as a way to potentially change the image. Um, as we think about other powers beyond China and, and the United States, what we find is that Turkey and Russia are significantly more popular than the United States um, overall. Um, within the regional actors, Saudi Arabia is more favored than Iran, but by somewhat smaller margins than might be expected. And I'll, I'll get into that as we look at the data um, through the presentation. Um, and one of the things that we find, and again, we don't have the Gulf for the reasons I, I noted before in this survey, but across the countries we do have, Iran is not really viewed as a significant threat in the eyes of most publics. And finally, um, given the recent Abraham Accords that were signed, we, we asked a question about this, and we find that in, in the vast majority of countries, there's very low support for the Abraham Accords. So with that, let's uh, shift to looking at the data itself. Um, here I com we compare the views of, of China and Russia. So we ask citizens, you know, do you have a favorable, somewhat favorable, or, or not favorable view of the United States? And the same with China. We find is that in the United, for the United States, that, that support is actually very low, that you know, fewer than a third in all the country surveys say they have a favorable or somewhat favorable view of the United States. Again, this was done you know, right before the election, so this, this could have changed somewhat as a result. But again, a, a fairly low level of favorability for the United States in, in all the countries that we surveyed. In contrast, um, as we turn to China, we see that there's a significantly higher level of support. In, in, half, in three of the six countries, half or more say they have a positive view of China. And in, you know, in, in other countries, it's still a third or, or more. So in, in all countries that we survey, China has a, a more favorable view, uh, or citizens have a more favorable view of China than they do of the United States. However, this doesn't really address, you know, what are the, 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 the issues, how do people think about China? China's a new power, China's coming into the region and hasn't really been a, a, a country that has a long history there. And so one of the things we thought about is, you know, do people think of China as an economic threat? And as a comparison, we thought about the United States, which doesn't necessarily have the same level of economic interest in at least the countries that we surveyed um, throughout the region. But, um, you know, how do these two compare? And so we asked citizens, you know, what is, do you worry about, uh, you know, China as an economic threat and the U.S. as an economic threat? And we find is that in most countries, the U.S. is actually viewed as a greater economic threat than China. So even though China is moving in, that China, has, there's a fair, significant amount of trade with China, the people have not yet registered that as a potential threat. So in the case of Lebanon, citizens are nearly twice as likely to say the United States is a, an economic threat compared to Lebanon or as compared to China. And the same in Tunisia, about twice as, as high. And in Algeria, it's even even more that, you know, at this point, it's uh, it's it's you know nearly three times as high. The one exception is Morocco. And so in this case, we see that the two are about equal, that 15 percent for China, 18 percent for the United States. But overall, this kind of paints a picture of the, the region, um, you know, seeing China not really as a threat yet. So much of the story may yet to be written about uh, China, given its involvement in the region. However, we also want to think about, is China actually winning? You know, is the fact that it's not seen as a threat, does that mean that people have a really positive view of it? And what we do in this case is ask, you know, um, it, we ask a question that I think is kind of an interesting way to approach it, is that if a foreign country were to get a contract uh, to do a project, an infrastructure project in your country, what foreign power would you want? And so we picked a, a European power, in this case, Germany, China, the United States, Turkey, another major regional player, and the colonial power of, of the, the country where we surveyed. We find is that Germany tends to be the, the most preferred overall, uh, in some cases also France, but in most cases, you know, it's, it's a fairly high percentage uh, who, who are saying Germany um, or France, and in some cases, Turkey as well. And so we, we, we see here is that China and the United States are not preferred, um, you know, in, in most cases. The United States is below 10% in all countries. And China tends to be at the highest, it's in Tunisia at 16%. So there's not really desire for China 
um, or the United States in this case, to necessarily do the work that, you know, really there's still a, a desire for, for Europe to potentially do this work. So in a way, people don't see China as a threat, but they also don't really have a positive vision of China um, in terms of its, uh, its, its economic image and, and, you know, in terms of the work that it does. So it seems that much of the story is yet to be written. So one of the things that we often think about is the United States provides a lot of assistance to the region or to many countries in the region. And so we ask citizens, you know, do you think that U.S. foreign aid to your country strengthens civil society and does it advance women's rights? And we see that in, in most cases, you know, about four in 10 or more uh, say that, that U.S. foreign aid does help strengthen civil society. So fairly positive. I should note that we have a number of people say they don't know, that they're unaware of, of whether it does or not. So in some ways, the, these numbers are, you know, of those who do give a response, who have some perception, you know, they are relatively positive. Um, the two exceptions are Algeria and Libya. You know, in, in, in the case of Algeria, we generally see a, a wariness of any type of foreign aid uh, in, in previous survey work that we do. So this isn't necessarily surprising. As we turn to women's rights, we see a relatively similar story. In this case, you know, that the between 38 and 48 percent of citizens in all countries say that it is, you know, being used to advance the cause of women's rights. And, you know, again, with Algeria and Libya trailing and, and for the reasons that you might suspect there. And so thinking then about, you know, the new administration and the views of global leaders, what we saw is that, you know, uh, former President Donald Trump um, had, you know, relatively low ratings. So he was still in office at this time. And in all countries that we surveyed, one in five or fewer said that his policies, his foreign policies were good or very good for the region. By comparison, you know, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping is much more positively viewed. So in this case, um, in, in you know, all countries who surveyed, at least one in five say that they have a positive view of, of Xi. So in all cases, Xi is more popular uh, than, than, than Donald Trump, and in some cases significantly so. And certainly you can take Algeria or, or Morocco, where you know, attitudes are, are much higher in, in this case for Xi. We should note that again, this was done um, before the, the recognition of Western Sahara um, as Moroccan territory under, under the Trump administration. And so that, that this may have changed in some cases. However, at the time we did these surveys, we can see that she is, is much more popular. The other thing I'd note here, and I, I don't show it in the graphs, but that many people say they don't know about she. And in, in many cases, uh, about you know 20% say they simply don't know. Whereas for Donald Trump, it, it was typically fewer than 10%. So there is also a, a degree to which she is not really well known throughout the region. And you know, again, going back to the, the new encounter that the region is having with China. So thinking about, you know, could this change under Biden? What is the likely implications of Biden's win? We, we asked these questions, you know, who would have better foreign policies for the region? And in almost all the countries that we surveyed, we see about four times as many people saying Biden compared to Trump. So in the case of Algeria, 43% say Biden, 7% Trump. In Jordan, 29% uh, say Biden, 5% say Trump. And this continues in, in, in almost all the countries with the exception of Lebanon. In Lebanon, this is fairly evenly split, 17% versus 16%. But in this case, uh, you know, the plurality near, you know, close, not quite half, 42% say that both are equally bad. Um, but what's also significant here is a number of people say they don't know. So in the case of Jordan, four in 10 say they don't know who would be better or worse for the region. So there does seem to be some hope that in a way, even if Biden, you know, amongst those who do know and, and or do have an opinion in most countries, Biden is preferred. And then there is a, a sense that, you know, a lot of people don't know that they're not convinced that, you know, there is no, um, that the Biden would necessarily be worse. So there does seem to be some hope for Biden and the administration coming in to potentially try and reverse some of these, these challenges. And one of the things that we think really may have, have you know, uh, hindered you know, Trump uh, beyond some of the other things that happened earlier in his administration is the Abraham Accords. In this case, we ask, you know, is, do you uh, strongly favor or favor the normalization of relations between the UAE and Israel and Bahrain and Israel? And we find is that in, in all countries except Lebanon, fewer than one in 10 say that they support this, the peace accords. In the case of Lebanon, this is actually very strongly divided, that half of Christians in Lebanon say that they are in favor of the accords compared to 11% or, or less for all the other sects. So the other sects seem to look much more like uh, the, the other countries in the region, whereas Christians are the ones who stand out. And, and, you know, that seems to be tied in, you know, a lot of the findings we have in Lebanon seem to be driven by a, a positive view of the Christian community towards the Trump administration. However, we also have this question of, you know, will U.S. policy actually change under, under, uh, uh, under Biden? That basically, does the control of the party, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party controlling, you know, U.S. foreign policy, does that have an effect on, on, uh, on 
on American policy towards the region. You know, and, and the percent saying that it will change to a great or medium extent depending on who wins the election. In this case, in Lebanon, again, like you know, driven by the the dynamics, the sectarian dynamics there, we see a number of, of uh, or a large percentage half saying that it will change, whereas elsewhere it's it's typically between uh, you know three and ten and four and ten saying that it will change. So there is some cynicism throughout the region that we're likely to see significant change in the in the years ahead. So let's shift now to thinking about the regional powers and the data that we have here. So one of the first, uh, the first set we have here is the views of Russia and Turkey. So overall, Russia tends to be viewed more favorably in the US, somewhat less favorable than, than China overall. Uh, and there is wide variation in Algeria, 52% say they have a positive view of Russia compared to only 15% in Jordan. Um, but with most countries falling, you know, somewhere in, in between, um, you know, ranging uh, in, in Tunisia, 44%, Morocco, 43%. So a somewhat positive view of Russia, but that is, you know, tends to be uh, higher views of Turkey overall. That Turkey is one of the key, um, you know, has extended its foreign policy, has become much more engaged in the region. And four of the six countries where we survey, more than half of people say that they have a favorable view of Turkey at this point, including 65% Morocco. You know, the two exceptions here are Lebanon and Libya. Uh, in the case of Lebanon, this is highly divided by sect, uh, sectarian identity. So thinking about the war in Syria and Turkey's intervention there is likely driving a lot of these findings. And the same in Libya that, you know, thinking about how the, the, the Turkish, uh, how Turkey's intervened there, it's also divided, uh, you know, by, by region in this case. Um, Corresponding, we have views of towards Putin and Erdogan, and so in this case, we we see that Putin is is you know views aren't necessarily all that different. That um, in in this case, Algeria forty three percent say they support Putin or have a favorable view of his foreign policies. Tunisia thirty three percent, Morocco thirty two percent. So somewhat higher than Trump, um, you know, but again lower than 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 she overall. But really, as we've seen in a number of our past surveys, so there is in most countries that we survey fairly high uh, support for for. Erdogan, that in this case, you know, over half support him in three of the countries where we survey and four in 10 say they have positive views of his foreign policies in Tunisia. So there is fairly wide support, again, with Lebanon and Libya and thinking about the Syrian and Libyan conflicts potentially having an effect and, and dragging, um, you know, views of, of his foreign policy down. However, when we did this fifth wave, you know, Erdogan was, was one of the most favored across most of the region, um, you know, in, in the countries where we surveyed across 12 countries. So I'm thinking about Saudi Arabia and Iran, um, two of the, the Gulf rivals, um, what we see here is that Saudi Arabia is, is viewed, you know, fairly positively in, in, uh, in Morocco and Algeria, but there's significantly lower support and favorability in Tunisia, Jordan and Lebanon that in this case, a third to a quarter say that they have a positive view. Um, in the, the case of Iran, what we see is that, you know, basically a third or fewer say they have a positive view of Iran. So unsurprisingly, not particularly high in a case like Lebanon, this is divided by sect, but what this, um, and this extends as well to the, the leaders. So in this case, um, you know, Mohammed bin Salman versus uh, Khamenei, um, we see that, that Mohammed bin Salman is generally supported at a relatively similar level, this is saying his policies are good or very good, ranging from, you know, about four in 10 in Morocco to uh, as low as 13% in Jordan, 22% Tunisia. And again, you know, the leaders, uh, the Supreme Leader uh, Khamenei is supported by relatively few, fewer than a quarter in all the countries surveyed, including just 5% in, in Jordan saying his policies are good. But what I think is most notable here is that, you know, overall Saudi's leadership, although it does get higher marks in Iran, the difference isn't necessarily as great as might be expected, and it's not as great as what we've seen in the past. So in this case, you know, we can see that the difference in net favorability is only 2% in Lebanon, again, divided by sect. But in other cases, like in Tunisia, there's only an 11 point difference between the two. And in Algeria, um, you know, it, it rises up to 22%. But again, this is fairly small compared to what we've seen historically, say five years ago, um, that we, we are seeing, you know, significantly smaller gaps between the two. And the same with MBS versus Khamenei, um, that, you know, MBS's policies are favored, uh, or at least, you know, within the margin of error in, in all the countries where we, we survey. Um, but again, not necessarily by the 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 um, you know margins that we would have seen in the past. And so this could be thought of as some of the the policies in Yemen, um, you know, the the policies elsewhere in the region may be be dragging down support for Saudi uh, in in this survey. And so another question we have, given the focus on Iran and 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 is you know is it really seen as a threat to stability? And the answer really is in the countries we survey, it isn't seen as a greatest threat to stability. And Lebanon, you know, this is an open-ended question: what country poses the greatest threat? In Lebanon, you know, Israel tends to be viewed as the greatest threat. In other countries, it, it differs somewhat. But in no case in these six countries is Iran really viewed as a dominant threat. Um, and so 
or sorry, in 21% uh, Lebanon and elsewhere, it's fewer than 2%. In this case, comparing it to the United States, you know, as, as the graph on the left here, that we're seeing 15% saying the United States in, uh, in, in Lebanon and lower. So in most countries, and again, it's not saying the United States is viewed as a, a significant threat to the region necessarily, but it is saying that, you know, just as a point of comparison, that really Iran is, is not um, seen as a, a major threat across the region. And so finally, just to wrap up, um, uh, just to talk about a few of the, the methods questions we have, we did phone surveys again because of the, the risk due to in-person interviews of, of COVID. We had a thousand respondents per country using random digit dial techniques. In Lebanon, it was slightly different. We did a recontact survey of a, a list of 35 or 350,000 randomly, um, randomly obtained numbers through face-to-face -face surveys. And we did multiple rounds of the survey. So this came from two different phone surveys. We have to do much shorter surveys on the phone than we can in person in 2020. And then we'll continue some in 2021. So look for our, our updated findings. And we've done it in these six countries. We're still working to complete it in Iraq and Kuwait. And, uh, and in all cases, this was done by local partners in the region, you know, partners in the country, um, you know, or in a, um, and so it wasn't done by us here in the United States, but it was done by our teams in the region. So with that, thank you very much. Particularly those on uh, favorability ratings of the United States are not very surprising. We've seen, as you mentioned, similar results uh, for the last 15 to 20 years. Other institutions such as Gallup and Pew have also done similar surveys and sort of, sort of the result is very much the same, that, um, that uh, uh, Arab public opinion of, of, uh, uh, of the United States are, are fairly low. Um, and there is a differentiation between US foreign policy and America and the American people. Um, so that's not so surprising, but I wanted to know what you found to be um, surprising or new from these findings, um, given that you've been uh, also including other great powers and regional powers um, in your surveys. And do you think it reflects um, correctly the geopolitical shifts that we're seeing, particularly with regards to regional power dynamics? So that, that's a great question. Um, it is something that we were really interested in. I think what we dug deep on, is, as I kind of showed here, was the China question. Think about China as a new actor. We saw that it was typically viewed of the great powers most positively. We're trying to really dig into why was that. And it is, I think, you know, our first attempt to um, to understand that in a deeper way. And so we actually were thinking about digging into this more. And I think one of the things that surprised us is, you know, particularly given some of the the comments that you know Macron made about you know Islam and things like that, that France actually came across pretty strongly. So did Germany. Um, and, and we haven't typically asked about Germany. And so it really made us realize the need to, you know, we've asked about the EU in the past, but think about this in, in different countries. And insofar as you can think about Biden, um, you know, trying to, to change policy towards the Middle East, that really the European partners may be a very, very strong way to, to do that, building that alliance to, uh, mm -hmm. to try and uh, um, affect the region. So it was something that we haven't necessarily seen uh, historically um, in, in our data, and it, it is one of the new findings. In terms of it, um, you know, the, the other regional findings that we have, I mean, certainly the decline of Saudi Arabia has been one of the big stories over the past five years in our data. That, you know, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia typically had favorability ratings of, you know, 70% or more given, you know, the, the, the fact that it's Sunni, the fact that it's given so much aid. So certainly that decline. And I, I think, you know, thinking through the foreign policy, thinking through, you know, the, the, the killing of Khashoggi and, and things like that has really had an impact right. on people across the region. And so certainly um, that decline is there. Um, you know, it is one of the challenges that we have is normally we actually do see more movement on the other actors um, that we ask about. And, and we haven't had the chance, unfortunately, we're, we're asking about additional countries in our, our surveys to come. Um, but, you know, certainly the, the, the hope, I think, of the region that for Biden, we, we didn't expect to necessarily see such a strong, um, you know, um, such a strong difference between Trump and Biden, you know, that, that this was something that, that, you know, we knew Trump wasn't necessarily popular, but we didn't necessarily think that this would be the case. So, so those findings were also pretty surprising to us coming back. You know, um, we've, we've seen, um, you know, typically U.S. leaders are, are fairly unpopular. Again, as Biden has, um, as Biden continues, that may decline. We certainly saw that with Obama over time, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, certainly he's starting off with a, a, a much better position than we had, you know, really anticipated that he might. Great, thank you very much. So before we turn to more questions to you, um, we're gonna turn to our
uh, to other panelists uh, to give some feedback. So Asher, I'm going to start with you. Um, first of all, what are your initial thoughts or reactions to these findings? Um, and do they really represent what we often refer to as the Arab street? Um, what is the Arab street and how, how are these views shaped? Uh, so I, I'm glad I get to put my historian cap on here, just looking at the evolution of, of what the Arab street was and what it's become. Uh, so uh, this notion of Arab public opinion, which is also commonly known as the Arab street, uh, is long been the, the subject of, of a debate both in the policy world and the academic world. Uh, and the notion of, of an Arab street or Arab public opinion really ha goes back to the 1950s with Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, the Egyptian president, who made this idea of, of the Arab street something that uh, the international community needed to assess. Uh, and that's because Nasser was able to appeal to those commoners or the Fellahin peasants that represented the majority of, of Egypt's population. Uh, the large crowds that Nasser could summon seemingly at, at will during the 1950s and 60s uh, were really a testament to his popular legitimacy. Uh, similar to the use of uh, Saut al-Arab, uh, the Voice of Arabs was a Cairo-based radio station uh, to influence public opinion in Egypt. And, and really across the Middle East and North Africa, uh, that was the high point of, of both Arab nationalism um, as crafted by Nasser and also this idea of the Arab street, some Arab public opinion being uh, a testament to legitimacy. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, the Arab street became more synonymous with this uh, mob mentality. Uh, the concept of Arab masses was brought into uh, the majority of mainstream media uh, because the Arab street was more a demonstration of, of the absence of uh, effective leadership uh, post-Arab nationalism than it was a collective voice. Your example uh, that's often given is the, the socioeconomic protests of the 80s as a response to the IMF recommended uh, structural adjustment programs implemented. Uh, but post 1980s, there's a major shift. And this shift really happens because terms like uh, the Arab street uh, or Arab masses uh, were correctly criticized as Orientalist uh, in the way they were perceived, uh, these pejorative overtones uh, or dehumanizing connotations. Uh, so the terms gave way to a more nuanced notion of Arab public opinion, uh, a notion that connotes more uh, of a transition to democracy and political reform, uh, along with uh, both internal and external pressures uh, for greater political participation. Uh, so during the 1990s, this new Arab public, public opinion uh, began uh, during the first Gulf War as uh, an anti-US and anti-Israel campaign, uh, where protests really focused on outside forces. Uh, and this is where a lot of Arab leaders across uh, the world took uh, these, um, uh, were able to redirect this popular dissent against uh, domestic uh, oppressive regimes and, and focus instead on uh, these negative uh, notions of, of American expansionism in the region. Uh, but it's in the early 2000s that brings us to this modern idea of public uh, opinion in the Arab world uh, because there was a major transition in this concept of Arab street. Uh, first, uh, there were really three main components that led to this transformation of the Arab street. One was the large scale, large scale urbanization across the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, more uh, population in a smaller, uh, more concentrated areas, uh, which was also coupled with this mass educational institutions uh, that uh, were uh, both increasing literacy rates, which means more of the population can now uh, access uh, written printed media. Uh, but also the hundreds of thousands of students that were graduated on a, an annual basis, uh, which uh, they left university with this new status uh, and also higher expectations for what they wanted out of Arab society. Uh, so all of this was coupled together with this revolution in information technology, one that we're still seeing uh, evolving uh, today. Uh, but that really created the um, the Arab street that uh, came to fore with the Arab Spring protests, were, which were a culmination of these two decades of, of a new age of, of Arab uh, street politics. Uh, so in modern literature, this idea of the Arab street or Arab public opinion uh, has really been portrayed in three different uh, ways. Uh, so the first way maybe was um, can be uh, seen as more of an exaggerated uh, uh, depiction where protests uh, and our public opinion are harbingers of major socio-political transformations. Uh, the other is more of a dismissive perspective, uh, one that argues that our public opinion does not bear any uh, 
uh, or very little impact rather on public policy. Uh, and then this third approach, which is uh, an underrated approach, it both laments and uh, criticizes the silent majority in the Arab world as uh, being submissive and, and acquiescent as opposed to the very vocal uh, minority. So this Arab public, um, uh, this Arab barometer uh, survey uh, brings us, we really learned three main things that, that I've taken away from uh, the presentation from reading through the survey. And one is that um, it's the most important thing is that uh, the Arab public opinion in the Arab street is measurable. It's not some amorphous idea, but it's something that can actually be put to numbers. It's number one. Number two, it's not uniform. As we see, there are actually very significant differences across the Middle East and North Africa, at least uh, as we, we saw in this survey. Uh, and lastly, it's also subject to uh, the attitudinal changes in response to current events, uh, something that, uh, that we saw very clearly in the presentation. Uh, but yet the Arab Barometer Service, uh, Survey tells us what, uh, what the opinion is, but does not uh, account for why that kind of opinion has emerged. Uh, what are the factors that uh, create this idea of, of an Arab uh, public opinion? Uh, and that actually brings up a number of questions and, and I hope that um, we'll have an opportunity to discuss this. And uh, the one main question is uh, uh, to start off with was, uh, were these same polls to be conducted in Gulf countries? Uh, one might assume based on at least some other preliminary survey efforts that perspectives on things like Iran, Saudi Arabia, America, uh, or even uh, the Abraham Accords in Israel uh, might be different than, let's say, North Africa and the Levant, uh, which uh, are one degree separated from the Saudi-Iran conflict, one might argue. Uh, and similarly, how, how would uh, these kinds of surveys differ in a place like Yemen or Syria, where civil war violence and uh, local media control can impact the formation of, of public opinion. So in, in previous decades where the Arab presidential state controlled print media uh, and dominated uh, radio waves in order to redirect domestic protests, focusing instead on uh, this opposition to foreign intervention, uh, today uh, that's not necessarily the case. So we ask how do transformations in demographics and technology change the formation of Arab public opinion? Uh, and questions like what roles do big companies like uh, big tech companies or even Al Jazeera have in uh, creating uh, or producing the type of opinions found in the Arab Barometer Survey? Uh, and how significant is this shift in, in attitudes by demographics? Uh, for example, uh, the, that 18 to 24 youth uh, age, uh, is that vastly different from their parents' generation? Uh, and then the last question that I hope to um, uh, discuss here uh, as, a, as a group is, uh, what exactly does America mean in the survey? Uh, so uh, I think we've, we've all seen similar images, that well-known ironic image of uh, the Arab protests are burning an American flag while wearing Nike shoes and a New York Yankees baseball cap, right? So how are we supposed to quantify the difference between, or how might we quantify the difference between American cultural and economic soft power and that American political and military hard power, right? So what's the difference between the New York Yankees baseball cap and, uh, and then uh, that weaponry on the ground in, in the Middle East? Uh, so part of this is certainly a perception that uh, US practices uh, elite diplomacy in the Middle East uh, and has certainly suffered from a long-term failure to reach the Arab street. Uh, but that, that's something I hopefully we, um, we can address. And I'll, I'll end off um, just really commending the Arab Barometer Survey on, on how important it is by a quote from uh, one of the best known political opinion specialists at UCLA, uh, John Zaylor, uh, who famously said, if the public had an opinion and there was no pollster around to measure it, would, there, uh, would public opinion exist? So thank you for uh, your time. This has been really great. Thank you so much, um, Asher. Uh, excellent points. And I just wanted to also add to sort of the, the, the three um, points of transfer, transformation of sort of the, the modern idea of the, of the um, Arab street or Arab public opinion was the emergence of pan-Arab satellite stations in the 90s and early 2000s. So we've seen the emergence of Al Jazeera. Um, first, we started with BBC Arabic. Uh, but then you saw proliferation of other uh, pan-satellite stations and you've traveled in the region. Uh, I am from the region. Uh, wherever you go, you see satellites all over the place um, across the board. Um, and so that's what people are consuming. And um, uh, we can get into that discussion because part of your question also to, to, I think, Michael was sort of 
how are we seeing these uh, variances between the, the different demographics and what these demographics are consuming in terms of um, information or disinformation and misinformation. Um, I'll turn to um, Lucille now, um, who's been, as I mentioned, doing a lot of research on China in the Middle East. Um, so it's clear from these findings that China is faring a lot better than the US in the eyes of, um, of the Arab um, publics in the six countries surveyed in particular. Um, so what is China doing or not doing differently um, to basically deserve the, these, these positive uh, perceptions and walk us through that context um, in terms of sort of the evolution of uh, Chinese uh, Middle Eastern relations, but particularly in, in the Arab countries um, surveyed. Sure. Um, so first of all, I wanted to say a fascinating presentation, Michael. It's always amazing to see what the team at the Arab Barometer accomplishes in giving us data in an arena that too often relies on anecdotal analysis, particularly during you know, these extraordinary circumstances that have made research really uh, challenging. So um, as Marissa mentioned, we're here today to talk about Arab views on great power competition in the Middle East. And I hope that I can provide a bit of that context on sort of the China factor in these wave six numbers. So let's start with the big one, Chinese favorability compared to the United States. So China far outstripped the US among participants favorable views. And this also extended to whether participants viewed China as an economic threat or opinions of each nation's respective, respective heads of state. Uh, so this comparison of China to the US is precisely the kind of image that China has projected for itself in the region. As in the rest of the developing world, China has cast itself as an alternative corrective partner to the US in the Middle East. It does this rhetorically by talking about its doctrines of non-interference and win-win cooperation. So it's pretty easy to see why those buzzwords would be appealing to an Arab audience uh, that has for you know, a variety of reasons felt stung by American foreign policy in the region. Uh, China conveys these messages through um, state messaging apparatuses and diplomatic channels, as well as this whole other apparatus it has in Arabic language versions of Chinese Communist Party outlets like the People's Daily or CGTN, which is China Global Television Network, uh, formerly CCTV. And these Arabic language versions of those outlets have existed since the early 2000s. There's also a document that I recommend to anyone who's interested in China-Arab world relations. Uh, it's the only white paper that China has released on the Middle East. It's the China-Arab policy paper, which was released in 2016, right before President Xi Jinping did a tour of Middle Eastern countries. So this paper, outlines pretty clearly China's strategic priorities in the region, the kinds of rhetoric it uses to describe itself in the region, particularly when it comes to the ideas of mutual respect and maintaining state sovereignty. So these priorities and messaging strategies have definitely worked to keep widespread, widespread favorable opinion of China in the Middle East, at least according to these numbers, and definitely more favorable than the United States. One thing I think is really interesting here specifically is that China hasn't really gotten the backlash uh, in the Middle East that has, it has experienced in other parts of the developing world. So while different surveys suggest that the countries of Africa or Latin America or Central Asia have favorable views of China, we've also seen some pretty significant anti-China protests and sentiments develop in those parts of the world uh, for a number of reasons. So the difference when it comes to MENA is that, you know, in Africa, um, I think one thing we could talk about is the very different protest culture uh, in public opinion culture in the Middle East. Um, and also that China is less involved in the Middle East and North Africa. So as a result, there's less to complain about. Now, uh, if we're going to talk about China and MENA, I think we have to address the Belt and Road Initiative or BRI. So the BRI is an initiative by President Xi Jinping to recreate the famous Silk Road through uh, connected infrastructure projects, investment agreements, um, and so on and so forth that will sort of connect Eurasia under this Chinese umbrella. So the Middle East in general is at a crucial juncture, geographically speaking, for connecting Asia and Europe. Uh, but one thing I think is really interesting here specifically is that most of the countries in the survey are also members of the African Union. Uh, so we have uh, Algeria, Morocco, Libya, and Tunisia. So they have these unique connections, not only to the Arab world, but also to the African continent, which is a place where China is much more involved economically and politically. So China's general attitude about the Middle East, 
is that it's a politically complex place where external powers like the United States have historically gotten ensnared. And it's very expensive in terms of both blood and treasure. Uh, but it doesn't have these same reservations in Africa. Uh, so these countries enjoy a unique place in China's sort of international strategy, which makes it all the more crucial on China's end uh, that they're looked at as a good partner or at least a preferable partner. So another thing I think that should be noted that's unique to wave six, of course, is China's COVID diplomacy. So once it came out from uh, under the early days of the COVID uh, crisis as a domestic issue, China has done you know, a pretty remarkable job of reaching out to other countries uh, with its sort of learned experience of the disease. So by donating PPE, sending medical teams that you know, experience the disease or collaborating to do uh, vaccine trials of Chinese manufactured vaccines. So every one of these countries in the survey has received some form of COVID aid from China which certainly isn't going to hurt China's favorability in the region. Uh, and we're, if we're talking about China versus the United States in Arab public opinion, I think it should be said that how each country handled the coronavirus has played a role in advancing which nation is viewed more favorably. So I don't think it's too controversial to say that China was uh, more successful or at least did a neater job of stopping the spread of COVID-19 than the United States did. So we could have a completely different conversation on the hows and whys of that. But for this context, if you're sitting in the Arab world and watching these two scenarios play out, that might contribute to why you think Xi Jinping does a better job at foreign policy than Donald Trump, or in general is a more favorable leader. So right now, the question that might be you know, at the front of your mind um, is asking, you know, will China rival or replace the United States in the Middle East? Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that China is nowhere close to even uh, rivaling the role of the US in the Middle East and North Africa. That's not a role that China envisions itself for it uh, at all in the region. Uh, but these numbers tell us that, or confirm for us that this great power competition with China and the United States, you know, while it's a slow burn, um, it's absolutely an issue on the horizon for sure. I think one thing that struck me as well now as uh, vaccination plans are being rolled out in the region, uh, that it seems that many countries have actually collaborated very closely with, the, with China uh, to roll out the Chinese vaccine. Um, and um, in contrast to what we may think about, you know, Arab publics rejecting that vaccine and choosing, for example, to, to, go, to, to go with the Western vaccine, it seems that most people are perfectly happy to take the Chinese vaccine. So there's a trust factor there that is also important um, and worth um, maybe discussing when we get back to, um, uh, to you a little bit later. Um, but I want to take um, uh, sort of uh, Asher's uh, 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 questions to you, uh, Michael, um, particularly on this whole notion of, um, you know, how how would we see uh, different findings uh, if you had conducted the polling in uh, some of the GCC countries, but also the whole notion of, you know, what is America when that question is first asked? I mean, you do get into some granular issues when you ask about America's role um, or American support, and there there's definitely there um, more positive views that U.S. support does help these countries question. But um, um, but yeah, if we can sort of address some of these issues that Asher raised, starting with the, the, the GCC countries, um, particularly when it comes to uh, the um, Abraham Accords, um, as well as this whole notion of how do people see America? So that, that's a great question. And one of the, the challenges we face that, you know, we have been able to survey some of the GCC countries in the past, but it is one that's very difficult, free and fair access to make sure that we can actually get reliable data, because if we can't get a reliable survey or we don't sense that we can, we, we won't do it. And so in the last wave, we were only able to get one uh, country in the region, which was Kuwait, um, that we could get permission, but it actually they, about 40% of the, the questions had to be removed in order to get a, a permission from the authorities. So. It certainly is a challenge. We were then able to do it freely, but you know, we we didn't have, we, we can't ask about a lot of the sensitive topics. And I, I think at this point it would be 
nearly impossible to ask about the Abraham Accords there, unfortunately. So, you know, it is really a gap in our knowledge. Um, and my sense is that, um, you know, given the the perceived benefits, the way it's been played up, up in the by the state, by the media, you know, of the countries that have signed it, you know, as Osher is saying, that it is shaped by the context one's in, that certainly I think it would be seen more positively there overall if we could do that survey. And, you know, we're hoping, we're trying to work through that so we can have more data on that um, in the future. But it is really difficult, and I, I think the point is is very well taken. That certainly, you know, even in these countries and from North Africa and the Levant, we see huge differences in attitudes. Certainly, not being able to include, not having data from the Gulf right here, that would be a very different region. So we wouldn't want to extend the findings of this to say this definitely applies to the Gulf. But mm -hmm. you know, it is to note what we have, and and certainly even in the the last survey that we did, we were able to ask, you know, what is the greatest threat to to your country in Kuwait, and you know, the the plurality, uh, if not about half, said Iran. I mean, that, so there is a concern about Iran, certainly in the GCC. This is a much more salient issue. And so it is important to think about what are we talking about when we talk about MENA? You know, that the GCC does stand in, in many ways quite different from, from the rest of the region. Um, you know, we have tried uh, to, and again, even if you think about the countries we have here that, you know, Libya um, at the time was really, you know, just still at civil unrest. Lebanon has you know, had a almost financially collapsed state. Morocco has been pretty stable. Algeria has been through huge changes. Tunisia is free. And there's just such massive differences here, um, you know, that, that, that are hard to really say there is one view of the region. So certainly the, the point there is well taken. And we never want to say, you know, there is just one, one, uh, mm -hmm. one sense of the region towards any of these issues. Um, in terms of the idea of the U.S., I, I think this is always something that, that fascinates me, fascinates us. And, you know, think about what is it that people are thinking of? What are they actually taking when they hear the word, you know, America? And it is one of the reasons we're trying to dig down a bit more into what is kind of the brand, what are people thinking of, and, and you know, why we ask some of these economic questions. And it really surprised us the sense that people thought of America as such an economic threat, you know, perhaps as a military presence, perhaps as some of these other elements, you know, that in the region, maybe that would be bigger, but that, you know, really the American economic threat to Algeria doesn't necessarily seem that massive yet, you know, people are worried about it. And mm -hmm. so it does seem like it's a bigger concept. And, you know, we have tried to tease this out. I didn't show this here today. But we actually asked five different questions about, you know, Bush, or sorry, Trump versus Biden. And in this case, we asked, you know, about policy towards the region, policy towards your country, policy towards Israel, Palestine, policy towards Syria, and policy on human rights. And we got the same results for all five questions. That there mm -hmm. isn't necessarily a differentiation, that there is kind of this idea that, you know, America is, is, um, is, is, well, there isn't necessarily a differentiation at that level that, you know, they aren't paying that much attention to the, the nuances of policy on these different areas. So it is something that's interesting. And we do ask questions. We didn't ask it in this survey yet. We're still doing future surveys, but we do want to understand how do, you know, people view the, the government versus the people and, and kind of to, to, to you know, the, the points that have been made here. And we do find much higher support that if we ask, you know, are Americans good people? We typically see much, much higher level of support than thinking about U.S. government policy. So there is an openness. I mean, the soft power, you know, the power of, of all these different, um, you know, U.S. products, you know, soft power just in general, you know, and yet, I mean, I think to kind of uh, Lucille's point, you know, we have also, we asked this about China and, and the Gulf countries because we thought there'd be more of a sense there. And actually, you know, the predominant sense there is, I don't know. I don't know any Chinese people from China, mm. in Kuwait at least. And so there is a sense that pe Americans are known. American, you know, as a brand is is both, I think, the government, the people, and, you know, this broader culture that, that it brings. And, and there are divisions. You know, we do see that typically young people are more open towards the United States in our surveys, um, you know, particularly in a place like Morocco than they are el than our older people. So it does seem that soft power has some sway. Um, and, but it is something that we, we do try and tackle in ways, but it's really hard because people have an image of America, but they don't necessarily, um, you know, it's, it's really difficult to necessarily elucidate exactly what they're thinking about. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and then it seems that the first connection people make in their minds, and this is something that uh, we see reflected in, um, in what opinion leaders write in the, in the Arab press, um, is always foreign policy first. And then when you sort of start layering or, or taking other layers uh, off um, and getting into, um, as Asher mentioned, the culture, the people, et cetera, then you start seeing more and more favorable views um, as that you know, interview progresses. Um, so um, Asher, I wanna turn, to, turn back to you to sort of um, react to, to, the, to, to this aspect of, um, of the survey, sort of the differentiation between the different sub-regions within the region um, and whether 
in um, uh, in the scholarly world, we're starting to look at a different notion of Arab public opinion because clearly it's not, I mean, it has never been one monolithic society, um, but it has been very um, common to just sort of lump all the countries together and look at the region as a whole. Um, but we're starting to see more and more variances that are getting clearer, particularly given all these different shifts uh, post-Arab uprisings and the civil wars that we've seen in Syria, Yemen, and Libya. Um, so, so how do you think we will be um, approaching this data um, and the whole notion of Arab public opinion as we see more and more differentiations? Uh, I, I think that um, it, nothing is more telling to uh, describe the uh, need for uh, international media to simplify uh, a region or to lump an entire region together than looking at this notion of cold war uh, i think something that that's come up so many times the saudi iranian cold war uh, or something that's been used for for decades back when uh, when it was egypt and saudi arabia and, and monarchies and republics uh, so i think dividing the world uh, or at least the middle east region into this um, notion of a bipolar region there's only two sides uh, without realizing that there's um, there's a lot of gray in between uh, and that oversimplification is uh, certainly is, is elsewhere in the world but more so uh, in the Middle East and North Africa perhaps uh, than than anywhere else and uh, things shift so quickly even on a country by country basis uh, I believe um, you can correct me Michael if, uh, if I'm wrong in the timing but right the survey was done in Morocco prior to Morocco being included in the Abraham Accords so how did how did that change uh, then uh, some of the preliminary survey, da survey data coming out of Morocco was showing a very positive uh, view towards normalization of relations. Uh, and will this change once a face is put on, uh, right, once El Al starts flying into Marrakesh, does that change that kind of uh, uh, perspective? So uh, that, uh, Marissa, to your point, I, I don't, um, I don't see any way beyond the oversimplification of, of a region. I, I think when you divide a region into two, you're missing everything in between. Mm -hmm. And unless a country can fit into uh, to those categories, it, it's pushed to the to the wayside. As soon as something like Yemen becomes overly complicated, it's pushed out of uh, mainstream media because nobody wants to understand what's, what the different aspects are. So um, this is probably a challenge that, uh, Michael, you're dealing with on a regular basis, where how do you make generalizations about a region where each country is presenting something very different? Uh, and, and I don't have an answer on how to overcome that, but it's certainly one that uh, we're, we're probably going to be subject to for the the next uh, the foreseeable future. Thanks, Asher. Uh, before I turn to you, Lucy, um, I just want to remind the audience that we're going to be taking um, questions in the next ten minutes. So you can email your question to mep at wilsoncenter.org or tweet your question to at wilsoncentermep. Um, so please send us your questions. Uh, so, Lucy, I want to go back to um, one thing that that you that you mentioned um, uh, in your reaction regarding uh, sort of the the um, the knowledge gap when it comes to China and how that actually helps in a way uh, its favorability ratings. I want to know if um, if this is also if. Um, less favorable views of the United States are also sort of exploited for China's favor um, in the messaging, in the way that the narrative is framed on Chinese news uh, channels um, in Arabic, for example. Um, and then um, is there also a differentiation, and obviously this is not reflected in this survey, but would there be, um, given your knowledge and expertise on China and the Middle East, a differentiation between um, uh, knowledge of the Chinese government, how it operates, China as a um, global economic powerhouse, but also Chinese billionaires that have been very active in the Middle East, such as Jack Ma, who has been alongside the Chinese government, also donating PPEs and um, uh, and also you know supporting countries that he had he has relations with. Mm, absolutely, um, both of those incredibly interesting questions. The first one I'll talk about, I think, is China sort of leveraging this less uh, favorable view of the United States in the region. And that's 
absolutely across the board is something China does, not only in its Arabic language messaging in the Middle East, but interestingly enough, actually in its Chinese language domestic party communications. So this is something that happens in Chinese media that I think is very interesting. It, the Middle East is not a hot topic in Chinese domestic news, but when it is, it's very much used as a club so, to sort of beat up the reputation of the United States for a Chinese audience, which I think is really interesting because China frames itself as having, you know, sort of learned from the mistakes of the United States. Um, and so at home, it has a completely different purpose uh, in this other China versus US struggle that's outside of the region. Now in the region, absolutely. Um, and this was interesting, we saw this in a lot of the early, uh, the early Arabic language COVID messaging uh, in Arabic language channels like People's Daily Arabi and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so they would, you know, at the time where Trump was throwing around words like the Chinese virus and the Wuhan virus and stuff, China, Chinese Arabic language, Chinese media was publishing uh, reports about how that was racist and then also uh, crimes against humanity committed by the United States. And also what was interesting was that a couple of Arabic language Chinese outlets even published um, uh, a con the conspiracy theory within China, an Arabic translation of it, that mm -hmm. uh, the coronavirus actually originated in the United States. Uh, so sort of spreading that kind of, I mean, conspiracy theories uh, take off, uh, anti-US conspiracy theories do particularly well in the region. And I think Chinese media know that. So, so propagating that is absolutely a lever that they're happy to pull and often do. Uh, and as for this distinction between sort of public and private, I think there's already such an enormous knowledge gap between sort of the just the people of the Arab street and um, what China does in general, that I'm not quite sure there is, you know, an understanding of the difference between the two, particularly mm -hmm. given the way that the Chinese state is very much involved in the Chinese economy. You know, of course, we have the state owned enterprises operating, um, including some of the uh, pharmaceutical companies that are doing vaccine trials mm -hmm. in, you know, countries like the UAE. Uh, so I, I think that the, the general impression that, you know, I've sort of gotten from traveling in the region and talking to people is that, uh, and this is probably where Jack Ma comes in, that the reputation that Chinese people are good at business. And that's mm -hmm. sort of part of the admiration, the level of admiration there and the level of favorability that they enjoy. But it's, it's definitely impossible to deny that there's this huge gulf uh, between, you, you know, people, just sort of everyday people in the Middle East who have a lot more fish to fry than people mm -hmm. than thinking about China or what China is doing in the region. And I think that also goes for people in China who don't really think about people in the Middle East. They're very peripheral to each other. Um, even though there are these really old and indelible cultural connections between the two that are just really fascinating and make them sort of as natural partners. Uh, I, th I see that changing in the future, honestly, mm -hmm. as China becomes more involved in the region, but it will take quite some time, I think. Great, thank you, uh, Lucy. So I want to bring um, Ambassador um, James Jeffrey into the conversation, uh, given his expertise, um, to comment particularly um, on uh, the view of Turkey. Um, ambassador Jeffrey was a US ambassador in Turkey. Um, so um, Ambassador Jeffrey, how do you react to these findings? Um, are you at all surprised that Erdogan fares so well or that Turkey has such high? Um, oh, okay. I'm going to withdraw, withdraw the question <laughs> to, to Ambassador Jeffrey because we have some technical difficulties. Um, okay, so let's turn to some of the questions from uh, the audience uh, and the listeners. Um, we have a methodological question that came in from Ted um, Kalik. Do you need each of the government's approval to survey? Uh, do they have input into those that are surveyed? Uh, so this is uh, to you, uh, Michael. Thanks. So we, we it, so for a face-to-face -face survey, it really depends on the country. You know, there are countries that that have specific rules that you can't do this without government approval. So you know, we we work to to make sure that you know there isn't a survey that's that. I believe in survey days are important, but it also isn't worth, you know, putting at risk our interviewers um, and the teams that are doing this to, you know, potentially have them, them put in jail. So, 
we do not, you know, have questions from the government, but, you know, we do have to work in certain cases like the Kuwait example I gave with the authorities to make sure that we're following local rules and that, you know, that we're, we're there. So questions may have to be removed to field the survey to get permission, but there is no say from the government. We also don't take say from the government on who we select. If a government says to us, we want you to interview these people, we'll simply not do the survey. That has no scientific value and it's not worth the money that we would spend on it. So, you know, if we can't basically run an independent operation that chooses our respondents randomly through our own scientific process to be able to generalize the findings to the larger country, we won't do it. So that's that's for our face-to-face. -face. For the phone surveys, it's a bit different. You don't necessarily have to go through the same processes um, depending mm -hmm. on how it's being done because you're not going face-to-face. -face. There isn't the same chance of, of you know, being being shut down in that way. So uh, again, it, it depends on the country and all countries who work with our local partners who know the situation, who know the rules, regulations. And again, we make an assessment before each survey to make sure that we can do this independently from government control. And if we can't do it, um, as I've kind of hinted at before, you know, in some of the countries where in particular the Gulf, this has been a challenge, you know, we, there, there's no point in moving forward with a survey that isn't valid. So that's, that's our general process. Right, thank you, Michael. Um, more questions coming in. Uh, so to Lucy, are China's economic con contributions to the region substantially superior, or is it um, primarily uh, primary view derived from playoff of the controversial history of the US? I think you kind of answered a version of that uh, earlier, but... Um, yeah, no, happy to talk a bit more about that. Yeah. Uh, so if we look at importing numbers, China is a major source of imports for all of these countries, and it's number one for Algeria, Lebanon, and Morocco, and then either two, number two or number three uh, for all the other countries surveyed. Um, in terms of investment in these particular countries, uh, China is not as high of investor. I believe it's a, the number one investor in Algeria, um, but these aren't Gulf countries, and that's primarily where Chinese money is heading in the region, because that's where it sees profit being made. Um, so, but there also is this gap between rhetoric and actual money being made between China and the Middle East, which I think, uh, you know, is something we can see contributing a bit to the lesser favorability numbers, at least in perhaps Jordan and in Libya, um, they were less favorable of uh, mm -hmm. China. Um, as a result of that. In, in Jordan, uh, you know, there have been many promises of Chinese projects in the country, but a lot of them have fallen through, which is not, mm -hmm. you know, a unique experience in the region because Chinese officials and Middle Eastern officials love to talk all these, uh, you know, they talk Belt and Road, talk, you know, Saudi Vision 2030 or other economic development plans and how they naturally mesh together. But when it comes time to sign the paperwork and then actually do perhaps an infrastructure project, there have been significant uh, hurdles to get past that so it's not uh, it's not a completely uh, solid story of the two partners coming together with a lot of economic involvement. Certainly, it's a huge source of imports as Chinese imports make up a lot of many countries' uh, imports. So there's a bit more to the story here, um, which I think is also interesting uh, with sort of the question about China Inc. as well about mm. China Inc. not being as a favorable partner as perhaps European partners. But I think that, you know, the people of these countries have experiences with these countries and they just don't have that experience with China. Thanks, Lucy. And um, you pointed to uh, the whole notion of China Inc. versus Europe Inc. and Europe Inc. being more popular. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take that and turn it back to, um, to Michael and then to Usher to comment on um, given one of the questions has is sort of uh, um, uh, relevant to this topic. Um, so why is it that we're, we, we see more favorable views of Europe Inc? Is it that um, uh, Europe has been involved in the region much longer, but it, that involvement is also in the form of um, colonialism? Uh, so why is it that we see these more favorable views um, is it geographic proximity? Um, is it, uh, is it um, European development aid coming in differently? So what is it that is basically highlighting Europe more favorably, particularly versus the United States and China? Uh, Michael and then Asher. So that, that's a great question, one that we're actually uh, keen to investigate um, going further. Um, I think that, you know, our simple answer on that question, you know, and we want to think of this expands to more things beyond just the infrastructure project is, that, you know, German engineering is German engineering. 
And, you know, a, a BMW and a Mercedes are just very, you know, positive <laughs> brands and seen as very, very right. good. So, I mean, would this extend to other questions as well? I mean, we see this for the French as well, which also you know, may kind of connote this idea of quality. You know, it's, it's, it's brands that are very popular in that sense too, potentially. And so it may be linked with that. Actually, you brought up the, the vaccine question about who would be trusted to make a vaccine. And it was one of the questions we also wanted to extend this to to think about, you know, is this also to health matters, things like that, and, and think about how are people, you know, putting this together. But I do think that, you know, Germany in particular has a, a very positive, you know, association that's non-colonial. It's, you know, certainly intervened in some developmental ways. And, you know, even the the open door policy or the welcoming policy from 2015 to 2016 certainly brought um, positive views. When we've asked questions about Angela Merkel, she comes across as by far the most popular European leader. So I think there is kind of this, this balancing between you know, China's viewed positively and in some ways Germany fits that same role. You know, France, we see a very divided um, situation that in a place like Tunisia, typically it's popular in Lebanon. It's it's actually increased as, as our sense in the last year, perhaps yeah. with, you know, Macron's interventions, um, but elsewhere in a place like Algeria, it's typically low. So there is this very complicated history, but I think that in a way, um, you know, Europe and, and even, you know, the UK is, is more popular in Jordan, perhaps, than it is in other places in the region. So we mm. see some variants, but your, Germany seems to perhaps be the one country that is is you know viewed quite positively and we want to at least get a sense a better sense because this is actually one of the newer this is a new question we implemented for the first time you know how far this extends so it's it's part of our ongoing research actually thank you asher yeah, so uh just to take uh, michael's uh, point about branding uh car car companies and certainly <laughs> clothing companies uh yeah, there there's not a competition over who gets to get the next louis vuitton uh, outfit but it, uh, in in china there's not something a very similar discussion but to take that even further um these two aspects that really influence uh, three of them uh, that influence the uh, predominance of, of european ink uh, rather than china ink and um, one of them is certainly geographic proximity which marissa said is it's a lot easier to get on a, a flight um to to europe uh for a weekend than it is to uh to fly all the way to Shanghai. So uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's just a geographic proximity. There's also a linguistic one, certainly for North Africa in Morocco and Tunisia, where uh, uh, large portions of the population would feel comfortable speaking French in, uh, in Marseille rather than, uh, than Chinese. So there's the linguistic barrier. Uh, but then I started to take the cultural aspect uh, further. It, there's also uh, the film industry. Uh, the Chinese film industry is is growing exponentially, but uh, certainly European film is still predominant, um, as are uh, the sports teams. And if you just walk in, in mm -hmm. Khan al-Khalili, the market in Cairo, you'll find uh, every uh, UK sports club, there'll be more Manchester United and Arsenal, and, uh, and everyone's wearing this because it's far more popular. And I don't think that uh, China, at least not in the short term, has that same cultural power uh, in uh, North Africa, in particular, and also in the Levant, uh, where where it has that that, that dominance, and uh, it, that it may take an entire generation to change, but certainly in in the short term, in the decades, uh, that that won't change very quickly. Thanks, Asher. Um, more questions coming in, and just again to remind all of you uh, to submit your questions um, uh, via Twitter at uh, uh, Wilson Center MEP or um, at MEP at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, so a question for Lucille um, from Taylor Roth, uh, who's with the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission. In your view, uh, which MENA countries are top priorities for China and what are these priorities? And how is China able to successfully balance its engagements in the Gulf versus Iran? Absolutely. And I think sort of the answer to both of those questions is definitely we see the, the Persian Gulf countries being the priority. And I think that this is because obviously these countries are wealthier, but mostly because the genesis of modern Chinese Middle Eastern relations is oil trade. So once China started sort of turning outwards after sort of, you know, the chaos of you know, the Cultural Revolution and then reform in the 80s under Deng Xiaoping, um, it was clear that China needed sources of oil and it was clear that the Arab world was important. And this was at the same time that Arab oil companies um, 
we're looking for new sources, uh, new customers. So a series of meetings happened in the 90s between these two countries. Um, and there were there are lots of these really interesting stories about um, Saudi oil executives going to Beijing and just seeing all these bicycles and thinking we'll never sell oil here, uh, which is actually, you know, turned out not to be the case. Uh, so it took a few visionary people to really make that happen. Um, so the genesis of that is really important. And I think that uh, some of the, the priority there, of course, is oil. China is the world's largest national oil uh, importer. It surpassed the United States in 2017. Of course, given how important that Arab Gulf countries, you know, export oil, they're sort of a match made in heaven. Uh, and then in terms of the, between oil and sort of the BRI, of course, being a geographic linchpin and these, you know, cultural connections, you know, through Islam to other important regions like Central Asia, which, are, which is a critical region in the BRI. That's, you know, a tremendously important priority. I think another interesting priority here uh, is that China, while it has all these really, you know, important and kind of urgent interests in the Middle East, it does not want to sort of step into the pitfall that it says the United States has of being sort of involved in all these conflicts. So this is where the question of regional balancing comes in, which is sort of the second part of that. So China has this relationship with Iran at the same time as it has relationships with these other countries. But Iran is a lot more controversial, I think because Chinese companies have gotten burned with the experience of the international sanctions regimes on Iran from a variety, in a variety of sectors, including oil. We can think about the really famous arrest of the Huawei executive, uh, Meng Wanzhou uh, in Canada and the US. That was all centered around um, exporting US made technology to Iran, which is of course sanctioned. So the way that China sort of manages this is it sort of hedges its bets. It's, it, says it's friends with all countries in the region and enemies to none. So it maintains these contexts with Iran. It maintains these contexts with the UAE and Saudi Arabia. But the, if you look at the numbers, and I wrote, um, I co-authored a report with the Wilson Center um, that was a really interesting look at this regionally, is that mm -hmm. China really pulls back from its engagement with Iran monetarily once you look at the economic and security data and really is much more involved with its less controversial neighbors in the Gulf, like Saudi Arabia or the UAE, um, or even Pakistan and Turkey. Uh, so a lot of really interesting things are happening here. And this is something that sort of makes Iran nervous, is that it, it realized that it is a liability to China. And so it's trying to catch up to the other countries in terms of partnership with China, because it seems that you know, this will be a source of you know, a bounty from the East that this partnership will help revitalize a lot of these economies and Iran's economy is certainly struggling for sure. Thanks, Lucy. Um, I, I do want you at some point uh, to comment on why the, the treatment of the Uyghurs is not sort of factored into these favorability ratings, but I wanna ask um, Michael first, whether there were follow-up questions on that issue, um, uh, particularly to try to, un to unpack like why these views are not are sort of hidden or or did not affect the favorability rating. So, uh, Michael. So that that's a good question. Unfortunately, we didn't have many follow ups here, um, in, in part because they're phone surveys. So typically we do a 45 minute survey in person and these have to be about 20 minutes. So we, we actually mm. have very, very short. Um, so it has been one of the challenges. I mean, it's an interesting methodological challenge to uh, to see how we can you know, do this during COVID, but um, it has been one of the limitations. I, I will say we've talked about this uh, a fair amount and I, our sense is that, you know, there isn't necessarily a, a wide sense of, of the Uyghur issue across much of public opinion in men at least, you know, that, that yeah. hasn't really, um, you know, become something that's well known um, throughout yet. I mean, it is it is something that is out there. It's certainly being talked about, but it, it I don't think it's really, you know, been, you um, become relevant. And so it is one of the questions we may ask in the future is, you know, are you aware of this issue simply to, to gauge awareness? Because our sense is that if it were known, um, you know, certainly it would have a, a negative uh, effect in, in many parts of the region towards China. Um, but so our, our best guess would be that it simply isn't really well known, but um, we need to, to conduct future research to validate that. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, um, has not been sort of a top agenda item um, or a talking point for the leadership in the region, uh, of course, with varying degrees. Uh, but it, I think it has been somewhat covered 
by at least Al Jazeera and and maybe not so much Al Arabiya, but I, I have seen some coverage on that. Um, but it would be interesting to see the level of knowledge and how it affects it. I, I think um, that certainly, the, you know, what's happened lately, you know, with the, the increased reporting, the, you know, the BBC doing a fair amount of, of work on this, too, that it, it may start to grow, but it, it typically will take some time. And so often we yeah. see, you know, you know, one of the things that we found in, say, the recent surveys is that, you know, public elite public opinion is really leading on COVID. That is, you know, COVID rates have gone up, that the elites are saying the government's doing a worse job than kind of, you know, other people. So I think, you know, this is something that may take a bit of time to, to, to really fully become there, but certainly it, it is something that, that we will be tracking in the years to come. Yeah. Uh, Lucy, um, your your view on, on this issue before we turn to more questions. Yeah, sure. So there's a lot of moving pieces when it comes to sort of the Uyghur question and public opinion in the Arab world. And this also isn't a place where Arab governments are sort of denied agency. You know, there's a lot of narrative of China's got, uh, you know, the leaders of the Muslim world sort of held under an economic thumb, uh, which is true. That's absolutely part of the equation. But there's, you know, several other things happening at the same time. Uh, I think a lot of what uh, the Chinese authorities talk about when they talk about Xinjiang and the Uyghurs is they talk about Islam, Islamism, they talk about separatism. And those are things that are really frightening to a lot of the autocratic leaders in the Middle East um, because they are worried about those exact same things. Um, so you, they're pressing all the right buttons when it comes to sort of language on that issue. I think it also doesn't help that the Uyghurs are, of course, um, not Arabs, which, you know, sort of denies them uh, like that sort of, in, you know, initial natural connection as part yeah. of the Muslim world. And I think, you know, it's also true that to expect sort of the Muslim world to be united on one issue is uh, sort of not sort of the reality of the Muslim world um, as we've seen it before. Uh, and there's also like China's done a lot of really, in addition to the sort of economic levers it pulls to sort of keep uh, Middle Eastern and Gulf leaders quiet on it, also it deploys a lot of South power. So um, there's this organization in China called the Chinese Islamic Association, which um, starting with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, China began deploying this organization to sort of the Arab world uh, or the Muslim world, I mean to sort of get them on their side in that conflict because of course China's next door to Afghanistan definitely have tense relations with the Soviet Union. They saw that there was this opportunity for Islamic soft power. And so as we've seen over time with this issue, they sort of deployed that organization again, mm -hmm. but into the Arab Muslim world to sort of change public opinion. And we saw, we've seen this um, since the initial Uyghur riots in 2009 and then onwards up until the present day. So you can you see all these instances of these association members meeting with you know these uh, heads of state, the um, Imam of the Grand Mosque in Mecca. I mean, all these sorts of soft power connections. They are the ones that organize Hajj every year. Um, mm -hmm. There's a pretty big doc documentary that they did um, that was organized by the Chinese Islamic Association and then distributed in Arabic as well as English and Uyghur. Uh, so lots of things are happening all at once. And so that sort of contributes I, to why the lot of really urgent issues more proximate to people of the Arab world. I think another question here is conspiracy theories. A lot of people aren't sure who to believe on this topic. Um, so it's, it's, again, it's a problem of information. Uh, so I think we'll definitely see the issue evolve as going forward. But right now, these are sort of the factors on the table contributing to that. Great, thank you, uh, Lucille. Um, one more question um, here coming in from Danny uh, Kenyon, US military. How do Arabs view great power actions through paramilitary groups um, such as Russia and the Wagner Group um, in, in Syria, for, for example? Um, does the Arab street recognize that this is Russian military activity? Um, Michael Asher, um, Michael, do you wanna? take a stab at this? Sure, we, we don't have direct uh, data on that. Um, we, we don't ask specifically about, about those groups, but I do think that, you know, we can look at, and as we often do the in, in the case of Libyan intervention, that, you know, that su support for Russia is much higher in, uh, in the East uh, than it is in the West. And, you know, certainly in, in Syria, we don't have data on Syria, unfortunately, but if we reflect on kind of the Lebanese groups and who has an interest in Lebanon, you know, it does seem reflective that, that there is knowledge that Russia is intervening, even if, uh, you know, in different formats. 
it would it would seem that there's a clear association there. So we can't say just specifically the the link between you know individual paramilitary groups, other you know specific groups, in Russia itself, and how much those are seen as aligned. But certainly there is a broader narrative that comes through. And as we you know here we just presented the overview of the data, but as we you know dig into that by you know key key different groups that, that have different views of um, the conflict, you know it is clear that there is a knowledge that that Russia is you know active in, in these places and is presumably the extent would be that you know it's a realization that, that these groups are affiliated with um you know with russia asher do you want to add uh, to that i think it all it all depends um on uh, something that marissa had mentioned earlier the power of, of satellite television so uh the public uh, will know what satellite television tells them essentially uh these paramilitary groups are not waving uh either Russian flags or American flags in order to announce their their intentions. It's far more subtle than that. So unless the subtlety is interpreted and presented in a way you know, for mass public consumption, it's not going to become apparent or, or overly evident to uh, the general audience. Uh, so there is a, a degree in power, uh, as we're seeing today in these large tech companies, not just um, in the United States, but certainly in, in Middle East and in North Africa, these satellite television stations uh, like Al Jazeera have a great role in, in shaping public opinion and public knowledge of, of what's happening. So um, in the, to predict what an audience uh, or what a, the Arab street would think of a particular group, uh, it's just a matter of watching uh, the reports uh, from these uh, major Arab uh, news networks and then deciding uh, what the major themes are. And you can probably predict what the uh, what the outcome would be in a, a type of survey. Thanks, Asher. Um, since we're still um, on Russia, let me um, go back to you, Michael, and ask you um, about whether there were also follow-up questions. And I know there, there, was, there were time limitations. Um, but if this also is part of your sort of calculus moving forward with, with regards to views of Russia, um, that re despite what people see uh, and consume in terms of news coming out of Russia regarding human rights abuses and um, oppressive uh, uh, policies by the government and, and particularly, um, uh, you know, the um, lockdown on dissent, how that... Um, does not seem to really matter or be a factor in viewing Russia more favorably than the United States, um, which, um, and I think the, the verdict is still out as to how we see views of the United States post the events um, uh, on the US Capitol January 6th, how that sort of changes views of the US as well. Um, but it, it'll be interesting um, to dig a little bit deeper and try to understand where do these that you know the human rights card at least factor into the um, uh, perceptions of Russia versus perceptions of the United States? I, I think that's a great question. It's something that in the past uh, we dug a bit more into thinking about you know how are people defining either these countries as being democratic or not? You know, is there a perception that they are maybe about some questions about the own internal politics of these countries? We haven't done that in recent years or recent waves, but it's something that we may need to bring back, I think, for these issues. And it is something that we've seen not only with, you know, you know with with Putin, but also with with Erdogan, that there is mm -hmm. a very, very strong support despite what's happening there. And in a way, I think my own my own view is that that's probably more reflected through what does Erdogan mean for the region as opposed to what does he mean at home that, you know, the Arab intellectuals, some of the dissidents are actually in Istanbul that, you know, you can be you can be there, but you you know you can't be against him. But you can you know certainly criticize governments from elsewhere in the region, in Istanbul, um, and and so on. And you know certainly the the way that he's portrayed himself as a hero to 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 Gaza, you know the way he's portrayed himself as trying to intervene in different countries. It, it is I think one a lot of sympathy, mm -hmm. and that I think that's primarily the the foreign lens is how people are thinking about him much more than you know what his 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 right, what he's done in Turkey. And also, I mean, certainly the, the Turkey, although it's gone through economic challenges more recently, you know, was kind of a success story initially under him that he really kind of brought this this vision. And so, you know, one of the things that, that we find very surprising, and we get a question about this fairly frequently, is that if, you know, Erdogan represents kind of this Islamist point of view, yet even though we're seeing this kind of anti-Islamist trend in the, the surveys, you know, mm -hmm. that he's still widely supported. And so it does seem that it's, you know, the fact that he's a strong, 
or he portrays himself and I think is often seen as a strong and decisive leader, you know, who's actually solving problems that are coming up in the region, um, you know, and so on, that that's really favorable towards him. And I think the same might extend towards, towards Putin to a lesser extent, that it's not so much about what's happening at home in Russia, but how Putin's intervening in the region. How does that, you know, reflect on people's own points of views, how they're thinking about that? And, and it really is issues closer to home than it is what's happening abroad. And and, you know, as we look at the data overall, I, I think that, that that's what people are looking for. We have other questions at times that are asking about, you know, a strong leader. And I think there is a sense that, you know, there hasn't been reform at home. There hasn't been people in the region who are necessarily, you know, breaking through, fixing the economy and things like that. And so, you know, at least the portrayal of this kind of strong leader who's willing to kind of cut through, particularly like someone like Erdogan is, is a very strong, you know, and very attractive idea right now. And in a region that's that's been through a lot and is really looking for stability, strength, and and uh, you know solutions to domestic problems, and that that side I think shines through more brightly in some of these cases. Yeah, so it's it's sort of uh, the leadership deficit or that vacuum that he's filling, but as you mentioned, also um, standing up to the West, um, and you could say the same, I guess, about Putin. Um, uh, you know, versus the United States in particular. Um, so we have um, a few minutes left, and I want to leave each of uh, each one of you with um, the same question. So if you can um, answer it um, in in two minutes or less, um, given this this data um, that gives us um, an idea as to where people stand on various issues regarding um, great uh, power competition um, in the region. Uh, and re regional powers, um, what would you um, advise the Biden administration moving forward as they uh, chart out the path and their basically foreign policy um, uh, towards the region? Um, what, what specifically would you sort of point out to them to, to consider as this policy is, be is, is being uh, developed? Michael, we'll start with you. Sure. So I think the first real lesson from this is, again, the popularity of Europe relative to the United States, that, you know, insofar as there is a transatlantic alliance that that re-engaging that, building it and, you know, making sure there is a, a coalition of, of countries or, a, a, you know, a, a, an alliance that's willing to kind of move forward to really work through that. And I think, you know, kind of taking a step back, working with the European partners would be a really, really key message for the Biden administration towards the region. Um, you know, secondly, I think there is the challenge of, of U.S. foreign policy that obviously has been there for many years, which is that, you know, citizens across the region are very, very frustrated, you know, by by the issue of Israel-Palestine. And, and so Western Sahara is recognized. So certainly there are pieces here that could, could mitigate that. Um, but it is going to be a challenge going forward. And I think that, you know, the the fact that Arab public opinion is is so uniform on this. We saw this with the Abraham Accords. It is going to be a struggle to think about what that is. And, and you know, given that the Biden administration is unlikely to, to change that, it's going to be a continual um, challenge, at least to, to win over hearts and minds across much of the public. But that said, there are ways. I mean, we saw that with aid. We saw that, you know, certainly in, in other uh, elements, the soft power and the connections there, that, you know, that um, that there is a, a sense that, you know, building that, continuing to strengthen the, the length of, of aid, and, you know, intercultural connections there, you know, may um, increase. And, and so certainly there's an opportunity here, but I would certainly advise, uh, you know, closer coordination with the European allies. Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, Asher? So uh, there was a well-known line in uh, American uh, foreign policy during the 1920s uh, where uh, diplomacy follows the dollar. And uh, this is a unique situation. I, I was uh, going through my... Uh, historical knowledge uh, how uh, the past four years, no new uh, US military interventions have begun uh, for now four plus years. Uh, so uh, how can uh, Biden administration build off of this relatively peaceful time, at least between US and, and uh, Middle Eastern states, uh, both in, in helping uh, uh, flashpoints like uh, Syria and uh, and Yemen, but, but more broadly in, in improving this kind of American image uh, in the Middle East specifically, uh, and looking at the way that American culture can then be used as more of a diplomacy, the way that American brands can be used in order to spread that diplomacy, not um, so where Middle Eastern populations won't uh, think about America as uh, at the tip of a bayonet, but rather America is the tip of um, a uh, corporate brand or that kind of image. Uh, so changing that image and using that culture, I think, will be essential to any successful foreign policy. 
I think sort of my, uh, I don't see that there will be a large change uh, between the Trump administration and the Biden administration on China in the Middle East, because being tough on China is, you know, pretty popular um, among parties. Uh, I think that there are productive ways to which, you know, the U.S. can sort of factor in this upcoming sort of competition that is going to see. I think one interesting thing that I will echo Michael's point about collaborating with Europe the, uh, and the region to perhaps, you know, deter China where it uh, threatens U.S. interests. Uh, so, you know, for example, the U.S. has successfully worked with Europe before and China on, you know, initiatives like the JCPOA. Uh, and, you know, through sort of that tripartite coordination with the people in the region, I think that that's possible. It's not going to be an urgent issue, but I mean, we will see as these numbers show, it's going to become increasingly important as the years go by for sure. Thank you, Lucille. Um, thank you so much, um, Michael Robbins, for uh, sharing the findings of the Arab Barometer Survey with uh, the Wilson Center audience. Um, thank you to both Asher and Lucille uh, for your uh, commentary and for your feedback. Um, thanks to all of you for watching and for your questions. And we look forward to seeing you again um, next month with more programming on um, the economic outlook of uh, the MENA region in 2021 um, and followed by another discussion on um, where we are at uh, 10, years, um, 10 years into or since the Arab uprisings. Um, and uh, thank you again for watching.